All right, question number 24. Fi the function f is continuous and differentiable, which means no holes and the derivative exists everywhere on the interval from negative 5 to 5. So I'm going to kind of sketch a little bit of a graph here, um, and we're going to play around with this graph. They gave me two actual points. They said at negative 5, the value of my graph is negative 10. So we got negative 5, negative 10. And at 5, at this other extreme, the value of my graph is positive 10. So here we're asking questions if these quest statements are always true, sometimes true, or false about this graph, okay? So let's talk about this. Even function. They want to know about f being an even function. Well, if something's an even function, f of x is equal to f of negative x. So let's just take the two points that we have. Is f of 5 equal to f of negative 5? Not true. So this is definitely false for us, meaning f is definitely not even. Okay, they want to know, c is f of 0, 0? Well, can I put the point here, 0, on the graph? Sure, why not? Does it have to be 0? And the answer is no, of course it doesn't have to be 0. So this is sometimes true. All right, how about the slope? Could the slope be 0 for some value between negative 10 and 10? Sure, why not? Slope being 0 just means it's a max or a min. So, for instance, I could have something like this, right? Where the horizontal line would have a slope of 0. Why not? So, yep, that's definitely sometimes true. Does it have to be? No. I could draw, connect these lines, these points with a straight line, and the slope would not be 0 between those two values. That's why it's sometimes. All right. Does the slope have to be bigger than 0 for all x's between negative 5 and 5? Meaning, does f of x have to increase for all values between negative 5 and 5? No. It could. We could connect these with a straight line. Once again, slope is positive for all values. But, however, we could have kind of a graph that goes up and down and up and down and then ends up at 5. And now the slope would be negative for regions in between. So, not necessarily true, making it sometimes true. Okay, um, do the y values have to be between negative 10 and 10 for all values between, of x between negative 5 and 5? Well, these y values are, but does that mean we have to stay in this box that they've created? No, we can go out of the box and then back up at the y values they gave us. So that is not necessarily true. Could we stay between them? Sure. Once again, our line connecting the two. And that would keep those y values between negative 10 and 10. So once again, sometimes true. All right, f of x, as the letter f has a typo in it. This is supposed to say f of c equals 0 for at least one c between negative 5 and 5. Um, and that is actually true. If we reword it the way that they are talking about, right here, where we get rid of that prime, f of c will equal 0. Um, that is based on the intermediate value theorem, IVT, intermediate value theorem. It basically is saying if I have a y value down here at negative 10, and I have a y value up here at 10, we're going to hit every y value in between negative 10 and 10 at least once. Um, and that's true, right? So at some point in time, we're going to get a y value of 0 in between negative 5 and 5 at least once. Um, however, the way they had worded it, it was not always true. Um, so that, And in fact, the way they had worded it was exactly the same as, as basically C. Um, so we're going to say always true because we're changing the wording always true, and the in intermediate value theorem tells us that. All right, f prime of c equals 2 for at least 1c. Um, so f prime of c, that's say they're saying the slope. Well, where'd they get 2 from? I'm going to look at the average rate of change right here. Average rate of change would say f of b, like 10, minus f of a, negative 10, over b, minus a. Oop, not a, <laughs> 5. So, ne 10 minus negative 10 is 20, over 5 minus negative 5 is 10, which is 2. The average rate of change is 2 in this region right here. 
So by the mean value theorem, at some point in time in our interval, the average rate of change will equal the instantaneous rate of change if our function is continuous and differentiable. And that's true. So this is always true. Because once again, just in case you forgot, f prime of c is the instantaneous rate of change. All right, f of c equals 9 for at least one c between negative 5 and 5. This is just like f. This is talking about the intermediate value theorem. So once again, we had y values from negative 10 to 10. So one value, 9, is in between those two. And our function will hit it at least once. So this is always true again. All right, last problem. Complete the following problem without the use of a calculator. We have a position equation. We want to know when the velocity of the particle, when's it at rest, when's it moving left, when's it moving right. So we need to know the velocity, which is just the derivative. So v of t, let's do a right here, is equal to 3t squared minus 12t plus 9. And that's just the answer for part a. Part b, when is it at rest? So let's set it equal to zero. Some things at rest when its velocity is zero. So when zero equals 3t squared minus 12t plus 9. I'm going to get rid of the threes that exist everywhere here. So we got t squared minus 4t plus 3. It's like I'm dividing every term by 3. Um, this allows me to factor it very easily. t minus 3 and t minus 1. So this gives me two values, t equals 1 and 3. This is when the particle's at rest. So let's put these numbers on a, a number line, 1 and 3. And let's check them in the velocity to find out when it's moving left and right. Left will be negative velocity. Right will be positive velocity. So I'm going to plug 0. And don't forget we're plugging it into the velocity equation. 0 into the velocity equation makes negative and negative or a positive. Plugging 2 into the velocity equation makes negative, positive, which is a negative. And plugging something like 4, this would be positive, this will be positive, so that's a positive number. So when's it moving right? Moving right when it has positive velocity. So that's from, they don't give me bounds, so uh, that's from, technically it's time, and usually we always start time at 0. So I'm going to include, I'm going to start time at 0 here, from 0 to 1, and then from 3 to um, infinity, basically. It doesn't talk about when it stops. Um, however, this 0 could be traded out for a negative infinity if we include all time, positive and negative. Okay, when's it moving left? Well, it's definitely moving left in between the two from 1 to 3. All right, what's the speed of the particle at t equals 2? So speed is the absolute value of velocity, right? So let's see. Speed, once again, is the absolute value of velocity. So I'm going to find the velocity at 2 just by plugging it in. Um, I'm going to plug it into the, my actual velocity equation. So that's 3 times 2 squared, so 3 times 4, minus 12 times 2, so minus... 24 um, plus 9. This is 12 minus 24, so that's negative 12. Negative 12 plus 9 is going to be negative 3. Take the absolute value of that, and the speed is now 3. And I don't think it gives me any kind of um, units, um, so we can just say 3. The speed is 3. All right, part D. Write an acceleration for the ex uh, expression for the acceleration. Well, acceleration is just the derivative of velocity, right? So we're going to go ahead and take the derivative of our velocity equation. Acceleration will be 6t minus 12. So that's part D. Uh, what's the minimum velocity of the particle on 0 to 3? Oh, write an expression for the acceleration. OK, we're done with that. What's the minimum velocity of the particle on from 0 to 3? OK, so let's look at possible minimums. Possible minimums, minimums of anything occur when the derivative change from negative to positive. So we want the minimum velocity. So we're going to look at the derivative velocity, which is acceleration. So um, let's set our acceleration equal to 0. And this would equal 0 when t is equal to 2. So let's check this one. 
I'm going to plug in left and right of 2 into the acceleration. So I'm plug 0 in. If I plug in 0, I get negative. If I plug 3 in, I'm going to get positive, which means that 2 is a possible minimum. Um, it also means that our endpoints, because we want the minimum on the 0 to 3, so our endpoints. So here's my t values. My t values are 0, 2, and 3. Um, 0 and 3 because they're endpoints. And I'm going to check them in the velocity. I'm going to see which one of them gives me a bigger velocity. We already know that the velocity at 2, I just found that out, was negative 3. Let's plug in 0 into the velocity. Velocity at 0 is going to be 9. And let's talk about the velocity at 3. So V of 3, I don't believe we've calculated that yet. Uh, v of 3 will be... 3 times 3 squared minus 12 times 3 plus 9. Um, 3 squared is, uh, 20, is 9 times 3 is 27. So that's 27 minus 36. I believe that is negative 9. And negative 9 plus 9 is equal to 0. So looking here, what is the minimum velocity? The minimum velocity on that interval is negative 3 and it occurs when t equals 2.